Okay, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you watch this recording. Um, welcome to our module two webinar, uh, which many of you actually, all of you are going to be pretty much watching this um, recording uh, rather than being in the live session, which is fine. But anyway, since the recording has started and Yelena is with me, um, you know, just a disclaimer for her that it is the meeting has you know, started to record. And by continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to be recorded. Okay, so with that disclaimer, um, we'll go on to my next slide as soon as my screen works. Okay, so I'm going to you know, skip the adequates because there's no one here to kind of you know follow it or kind of you know distract from uh, this recording today. Um, so we don't have any of, of your classmates, but I, I, I sincerely hope that you're going to be watching this recording, which is really important um, from your module two perspective. Um, so today's agenda, um, we'll go over um, you know, the big data management. Once again, just trying to supplement what you've learned um, during you know, week three and, and also what you'll be doing in week four. So just, just trying to add um, to that and um, then we'll talk about assignment two, very important assignment, and it's going to be different than what you kind of experience during assignment one. And uh, of course, we'll go through a retrospective as well when we before we talk about big data management um, and uh, you know supplemental information on that. Um, we'll go over some retrospective on on the week gone by, and then of course. Um, I don't expect any questions live, but if, if there are going to be questions after you watch this recording, um, please feel free to contact me or um, you can you know, email to me or probably I think the best would be to put it up in the classroom, you know, the section where you can ask me questions and you know, this way, even others would get your classmates would get the benefit of um, you know, seeing that question and, and also the response that um, you'd get back, okay? So um, with that, let's go to some, some retrospective here on the week two and the weeks two and three, the week two from module one and the week three that you know, you've gone through yet. So um, first and foremost, you, know, you, you submitted a quality and timely deliverable, deliverable towards assignment one. And um, you know, everybody did an excellent job. Um, so I'd like to, and then, and you, you got my uh, hopes and expectations raised and, you know, I was really looking forward to, um, your, you know, your good participation in this course at the same time, um, you know, excellent, uh, assignment submissions in future. So, but I, I still wanted to know your thoughts on this assignment. Um, but since I can't get any live questions today, um, I would hope uh, that you could share your thoughts when I send out this survey, uh, when, I, when I'll send out the survey after, you know, after the middle of the course, which is going to be, you know, after week four sometime. So, you know, please share your thoughts uh, on um, the material or the assignments that you've gone through um, that is going to be really helping me um, and, and, and Yelena and Kate and, and the entire department, okay? Um, so your discussion postings, I, I was just talking to Yelena about the fact that there's not a single discussion posting um, till the end of um, day Tuesday, um, which it, when it was really due at the end of week three of your course. Um, but I, I just assumed that, you know, it, it was a very overwhelming kind of a week, uh, maybe the reading material you had, um, was too much, but anyway, I still, it was a deliverable, which was due, and I had not heard anything from you prior to the end of day Tuesday. In any case, being the first instance, I have uh, given you a new end date, which is, end, which is tomorrow, Friday, uh, November 11th, and I will not be extending it. I already have a student who's posted it, and I will go with that. So, and and as I keep saying to you all, you, this is these are some easy points that you really do not want to lose. So, um, you know, take note of that. And I will look forward to your posting and good participation with your classmates on the material that you've learned in the classroom. Um, so until the start of week four, 
Uh, many of you had not accessed and logged into your AWS, AWS Academy Lab, which is going to be the one that you will use going forward. So if you do not log in um, to the AWS, AW, I'm sorry, AWS Academy Lab, um, you know, you're pretty much out of luck for your assignment too, because it has to be done in that lab only. There's no other way. And the instructions are meant for whatever you would see in the lab, okay, in that academy lab. So please, um, if if you are, you know, as soon as you, uh, you know, see this recording, watch the recording, and you've not done that, if you're not get an email from me, then um, you know, you you want to really let me know ASAP because, as I said, your assignment two is due on Tuesday. Uh, and there's, you know, you have to start. If you haven't started that assignment yet, you will have to start right away. I'm telling you, it is time consuming, especially being the first time that you're going to be in the AW, AWS lab, okay? Um, next, yeah, please, uh, you know, take advantage of these webinars. So I'm um, a little disappointed um, this evening to not see um, anyone uh, show up, um, understandably, that you are busy and uh, you may not be able to attend for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, if you cannot attend, um, these are not mandatory. I, I get that. But, you know, you lose the opportunity for asking questions to me live or going over some of the material along with me, right? So you lose that opportunity. But I hope, I, I sincerely hope that um, you are going to be watching and you are watching this recording um, and, and getting the benefit of um, whatever we cover uh, today during this webinar. Okay. All right. With that, um, the discussions I've already mentioned, uh, I'm not going to, and, and I just mentioned this during the last webinar, and I'm not going to reiterate or go through this slide again, but just to mention that, you know, this discussion postings, really, they are, you know, very much time bound. Um, they cannot be any late submissions. Although I extended it for one time, that's going to be pretty much it. Um, you have to make your posting as soon as possible during the time you're reading. Um, and as in the the the, um, the faster you have a posting out there, gives the ability for your classmates to respond to it, to ask you questions, get you part, to get that participation and and um, going right, and get that engagement with your class and and with me as well. Um, you know, once you get that, I think that's where you get most of your learning. Honestly, I mean, there's a lot of material out there and there's, you know, and, and, but once you start, you know, putting all that together in your posting and have that conversation with the, with your fellow classmates and with me, trust me, it will go a long way. Um, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, there's going to be a lot of learning based on that. So please do not ignore um, the discussions and, and starts your participation. Once again, you have to at least respond to two of your classmates. And if you do not see anyone um, anyone responding to your posting before the end of the posting period, you have to comment on your own posting. Okay, very important. I put this in the announcement. I put this multiple times. I hope you have looked at it once again. I put the same over here on this slide, and I hope you are watching this and and you know going to go over this slide one more time. So um, I've mentioned this multiple times. So you know going forward, I'm going to be you know strict with uh, you know what you can be graded for your discussion. So please make a note of that, and I want each of you to really be very successful with this and get the maximum points. Okay. With that, let's move on to our main topic of the day, right? Big data management. Um, and uh, this is what you did a lot of reading on, um, you know, different types of databases out there, like data lakes, you read about, you know, NoSQL and, and so on. So there's, there's a lot that um, you've already read. And so I just, just wanted to, you know, take a step back and see if we can really, um, validate these statements right what what are you going to um think are what what are your thoughts on these statements and when you read through each one of them and i'll i'll kind of read through each one of them just pause this video right if you're watching this recording please pause this video for a second think on it 
and then come back to you know the discussion right again back to this recording but um so let's go through this you know one at a time um just increase the size of your database to include more data that is how easily you can manage big data true or false what do you think pause the video think over it come back okay so let's let's think about it right let's think about it together now that you're back again um so increasing the size of your database to include more data can you manage big data maybe yes maybe not right um there are many powerful rdbmss that can manage a lot of data but once again we talked about what's big data what are the different types of data that are out there it all depends on what kind of data are you bringing in right are you bringing the data which is constantly uh, very well structured and you know not changing um and all that and it's not being streaming not changing a lot the schema is not changing a lot maybe maybe and, and maybe you want to have really um the database that is following acid properties maybe you there could be an rdbms for you right once again maybe yes maybe not depending on what kind of big data right so there is no strict yes or no answer or or to the, to this particular statement let's look at the second one rdbms cannot handle or manage big data you need other emerging data types pause the video and come back after you've given a thought to this statement so what do you think okay you cannot handle or manage big data do you think rdbms but it probably just give it away the last time we just talked about the very first statement that um yeah there are rdbmss that do a pretty good job of managing data and you know with the um changing rapidly changing sizes you can you know manage the size of the database you can increase the size of database especially if it's on the cloud you can have a scalable database and and all of that so maybe um you know you could still be able to manage it once again um it depends on a lot on your data type okay let's go on to the next one data lakes or data warehouses are the two sides of the same coin same thing but different names what do you think pause the video and come back to this all right so data lake or data warehouses you did some lot of reading on this one right what do you guys think well data lakes and data warehouses are, are two different architectures basically where data lakes could be used for a lot of you know data that could be moving that could be of different types it could be streaming changing uh, transactional a lot of all of that put together you can put it in your data lakes whereas data warehouse um mostly it, its use is to kind of put up a structure together that is kind of going to hold your historical data whereby you can really build your reporting and 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 when i say historical doesn't mean any old data it could be as old as even a, a minute back an hour back or in a day back right but the point is that you have there's a method to the madness and 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 you have a you have a schema in place you have a structure in place for bringing all that data that you're going to make use of for building some business intelligence over it some um you know some decision making or maybe just storing it for historical or whatever reasons for legal reasons or uh for for business reasons you're going to you know let your data be stagnant and and be there uh for you know analysis in future so it's again that two different architectures and I'm, I'm sure you've gone through that and i hope when you kind of came back and you paused and you came back to the video again um your answer was maybe not right they're two different architectures all right so with that i wanted to show you this infographic that i saw and i i know like looking at this screen it may like you know uh, it may not be legible so i'm going to go on and and, and just you know cut this picture into half and go through the first half here so what what this um 
infographic, which is, and of course I've put in the source here of the infographic, but it's, it's a nice picture of how the databases have evolved, right? In, at, a ve- at a very high level here. Once again, this is, you could call it a 10,000 feet or a 50,000 feet view of how databases have evolved. Um, right from 1960s where you had you know, an anarchical model database or network model databases to seeing the RDBMS, the actual um, RDBMS you know, growing in, in, in during 1970s where you started to see some of the relational data, database management system, which started to thrive and being used more in 80s and 90s, right? That's when you saw a lot of companies adapting to it. Um, Oracle came into play, the Sybase and Informix and all these, and DB2, IBM DB2, all these databases came into play and um, you know started being used by multiple companies on Wall Street, on large companies. Um, so um, that was the time for, you know, these databases, then it kind of started to, um, you know, when it get closer into 80s and 90s, you started seeing entity relational databases, the object oriented databases. Um, and that's when the distributed, you know, um, databases also started to come into being here a bit where, you know, there was a need for, you know, having your data distributed across uh, multiple centers, multiple machines, multiple data centers, right? So that was what was happening in 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. That's how things were, I wouldn't say slow, but yeah, it, it, there was a slow evolution, of, but there was still a, a very steady evolution of databases during that time. And then you fast forward and you come into um, 90s and 2000 and onwards, where especially after the advent of internet, right? What happened at that point? Boom, there was the data boom, right? Um, There was lots and lots of data that started to be generated, being captured by companies, being used by companies for multiple reasons, right? And then, and the different types, right? And and, and you have all these, you know, um, images and videos and and you know that that becomes so prevalent which wasn't the case before um but right after internet um you know things started to and you started seeing no sql databases you started seeing distributed systems um you saw the you know the 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 rise the birth of hadoop at that point um and and all of that so and and of course uh, the data warehouses came into being and and being used by for a lot of analytics, for a lot of, uh, you know, business intelligence kind of systems and so on. So all that kind of started to happen in in this century, um, right after 2000. So within the last 20 years, um, there was, you know, this this evolution was huge. And the evolution was not a single layer, but multiple, as you can see in NoSQL, RDBMSs, other object oriented and, and all the, the Hadoop data types, the distributed systems all kind of started to get, and you can see the different branches being put up. So when you've read through all your material in, uh, and during this week, right? And, and of course, going through this last couple of slides on the evolution of databases, I'm sure one thing that would come to your mind, right? If you are someone, a decision maker working in your company, um, and you have to make a decision on to selecting a database. How will you select? How will you make that selection? This plethora of databases, right? Not just what you're currently seeing on the screen. There are you know, hundreds of databases today that are out there. And you know, your goal is to select one. What are what are all these different things that should come to your mind um, when you know you're going to zero in and say, this is my database of choice, right? Um, the decision making is becoming more complex, but it is not rocket science. It is still not that complex. If you break it down, you can still get to what you want, or at least get to a small set of databases that you can then pick one from, um, but not like hundreds that you would see in front, right? So what are those Thing, what are what are the factors that 
you should take into consideration and how you could kind of get to get closer to selecting your database. I hope that's the dilemma that you may have faced or especially if, if not at work, if you're not working outside or if you have not thought about it before, but at least after going through all that material that you know you had this week, I hope uh, it, it, you would have probably thought about this. Okay, which one is the one I would select or I would want to go with, right? So the first and foremost, right? The factor that a lot of people or individuals or companies would say, okay, I, I care less for money. Money can come later. I could think of money, but trust me, um, being in this industry for, you know, and, and IT for many, many years, and, um, and also, you know, as an individual, you know, first and foremost, that is always the case is the budget, right? What is your budget? Do you want to go out and buy a thousand dollar database, a ten thousand dollar database, or do you have money to get? You know, you know, maybe you can go more than that, or or you want to spend, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars of, you know, worth of database, right? What what is your company into, right? So first and foremost is your budget, right? Right? If, if are you speaking in hundreds, thousands, or what is going to be your budget? What can you really afford um, for the database? Okay, so that's number one criteria. Number two, what type of data will reside in your database, right? What are you talking about? Is it going to be a, a simple, you know, structured data that could, you know, multi few columns of data, personal information of company of employees or students or the coursework and so on? Or is it going to be a lot more than that, right? I images or videos or, um, you know, is it going to be, you know, streaming data or is it going to be some, you know, um, data that is going to be coming in a almost in a batch form, right? Or the transactions that are being generated that is creating a lots of data. So what type of data? Um, that's going to be another factor that you'll have to think about. Um, what is going to be your user base, right? What is going to be the size of your user base? Um, are we talking about one person, five people, 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people who would be really... Um, querying or are using this database in some way or the other, either through a user interface or, or directly accessing it, right? Or querying the data directly. So that's going to be another criteria to keep in mind, like as to what kind of database or, or um, you know, is, is your database going to be able to support that kind of a user base? Next, how frequently do you need to update the schema and refresh the data, right? Is it something, is your data going to, is your structure of your data going to change frequently or is it going to be pretty stagnant? Or how frequently do you need to refresh your database, right? I mean, schema and the data as well. Um, what kind of activities are going to go on into your database, right? On a day in and day out. Um, that's going to be another factor that you have to keep in mind. So besides these, there are many other factors, like. Right? Um, will you need to access your database 24 by seven? That's that's going to be a very, very important factor because yeah, if, if your database is going to, um, you know, if you're going to select a database, that's going to need a lot of maintenance or would have some kind of a downtime or something that you'll have to maintain and manage. And it's going to be hard to manage. And if you don't have the skill set necessary to maintain and manage it, well, you're asking for trouble right there, right? So. Um, again, you know, would you be, you know, would you need to access, you know, do you need to access it and have your database up and running 24 by seven? Um, do you need your database to be highly scalable, right? Is it is it going to be, um, you know, just buy once and that's it? Or you think your user base can grow? You think that your data can grow exponentially? That is going to, you know, maybe, uh, need that you you kind of keep adding or changing your data your size of the data right or database what kind of throughput do you need from your database right very important aspect these are very important factors and i'm not saying that you know you will have to but you, if by answering each of these factors by addressing these factors you're going to get closer to coming up with your requirement right these are the things you need and then 
when you go on to you know be making a choice of your database you will see like a small group of databases that can really um adhere to or at least even some of the databases that you have in mind you can then take this set of factors and see if it applies to that database right so that's why we're kind of going through over these different factors here what systems and tools does your need in database need to integrate with right um very important because you buy a database and you say okay i, I have um I want um, Python or JavaScript that could be executed on APIs that could be executed on your in on on your database. And what if your database is not going to be able to support that, um, you know, API calls or making API calls to it and responding to it, or and especially from Java APIs or or, or Python based APIs, you're out of luck. It's not going to be able to work with the system or the the um, the tools that you have, right? Maybe you don't have the um, the the skill set even with amongst the people. Like if you're buying a database or, or you have a database that nobody knows how to run, or nobody knows how to configure, right? Nobody knows how to maintain and manage it. Once again, out of luck. So very important um, that it it can integrate uh, with uh, the resources and the tools um, and and systems that you have in place in, in your um, in your corporation, right? In your company. Then is your database going to be on premise or um, it's it's going to be off premise? Right? I'm sorry, it's going to be data on on premise, um, and it's going to be part of your data center. Is it going to be you know located and 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 maybe you know different data centers worldwide or nationwide, right? Um, are you planning your database to be on the cloud, right? If it is not going to be on premise, do you expect it to be on the cloud, right? Or can it be on the cloud? And are you okay with that, you know, being on the cloud? Um, the type of data, maybe the type of data that you have is government restricted and should be, you know, super, super secured that you probably may not be able to put it up on the cloud. Although these days, you know, a lot of, um, you know, cloud databases and putting stuff on the cloud is becoming more and more safe. But but you never know. You could be still restricted because there could be very super, super sensitive data that you will have to keep it within your premises, within your data centers that you'll have to run yourself and make it super, super secure, right? So it's so again, something to kind of think about, right? All these are different factors that you have to think about. But, and are you really boiling the ocean? As I said, if if my... Um, requirement is just putting some um, few thousand or hundred records. Um, do I really need a database? Can I just go with a spreadsheet and put all my data in there? Or can I just use my plain old access on, on my machine, Microsoft access you know, on my machine that I can just make use of? And because I don't need um, anyone to really you know access it, use it, I don't have more than a few hundred or few thousand records. Why, do, why am I trying to boil the ocean? Why am I trying to go and buy something um, that I may really not need, right? So once again, different factors that by addressing those factors, you may get closer and closer to the type of database or the database that you may really need and you may want to have, right? Or you may want to make it part of your choice. Then the other thing is, um, does it have to follow this, you know, um, certain characteristics like the acid characteristic? And maybe you've already heard about, you know, uh, as part of acid, the atomic, right? Whether the um, the transactions need to be atomic. Like, for example, if you're making a transfer from your savings to checking account, um, so there's a, you know, debit from one account, credit to another account, that both should occur, you know, either it, it occurs completely um, or it, if it fails in between, then the entire transaction should fail. You cannot have a debit uh, from one account and then it crashes or a credit uh, and then before credit happens, it crashes, right? You have to have this complete transaction, atomic. Consistency, right? Within your um, university, you could have just one student with only that particular student ID. You cannot have two people with the same student ID. They could be in a different departments. What if, if the entire department, all these departments are merged? You could have 
two different students with the same uh, student ID. Consistency of data is very important, right? So consistency of certain data that really matters to you. Um, you should be thinking about how consistent it should be. And consistently, if I'm giving a student ID to search for, I should just get one student, not multiple students. Isolation, right? Once again, if you have multiple uh, processes running, multiple transactions running, you want each of your transactions to be isolated in itself and not dependent on each other uh, so that you know you get, get into a lot more complexity and, and maybe there is a race condition. Which one should finish first? Or you know, this is dependent on this, or this is dependent on this, or this sees this, and this is that. What happens? Again, you don't know whether you know which transaction um, would get completed, or you should be really looking forward to complete soon. Durability, right? Um, anything that has taken place should be there. There should be a um, you know a, a log of that, or you should see. And not get lost. Not that should not be lost. Whatever updates have taken place should not be just you know lost forever, right? So if you're looking for a database with all these different properties, you look for maybe an RDBMS, right? An RDBMS that can have all the asset properties. It's known for that. Of course, there are other distributed system and NoSQL systems that are a little close. I would not say you know hundred percent. Um, adhering to asset properties but there are some you know that could and maybe you know you could have a partially um uh who, that can adhere to the asset properties that you can really still make use of right so next is you may have also heard about base right uh the base properties um whether it's basically available you're okay with that the system should be you know um that anything that is the information is, is going to be available by any any different different nodes of your distributed system. Um, the soft state, meaning you know that any any time you are kind of confirmed that you know you your state of your data or the state of your transaction is is going to be you know completed. It it may be, but whatever whatever is completed is can be seen by you, right? So that's what is the soft state. Eventually consistent. Um, you may see that your system is app database, your data is, is a data, I'm sorry, the data, it's a distributed data system across multiple nodes. And it's okay for your data to, um, you know, kind of traverse, like when it's being updated, to have that data traverse, the, those updates kind of traverse eventually, right? Maybe all at once, all the nodes may not have the most up-to-date uh, form of your data but you're okay with that, right? So maybe you're okay with, uh, you know, what the base properties are and you want it to only be, you know, um, having base properties because it's a distributed system. Most of the distributed system are either base or the cap, right? The cap theorem that you kind of, or, or the cap properties that um, you also learned about and you must have read about is part of your reading material, right? Whether you want your um, distributed data system to be you know consistent or applic uh, or available or you know partition tolerant right um, partition tolerant that any any node failures or if your data is going to be you know um, again partition on your network partition you still be able to tolerate that your data is still going to be you know, okay with that kind of a you know partitioning your data is going to be available, um, you know, at, at most times um, when it needs to be or when it is being asked for, right? Your data is going to be consistent across if you're asking for, um, you know, whether at any, from any node, if a particular student ID is searched, it still, still give one particular student name, the same student name, right? Consistency of data. So, um, and, but the thing is, you can only pick two of, of this, right? So there are, uh, if you can either pick C and A, if you have picked C and A, then maybe the partially tolerant may not be available. Or if C and P is being, you know, a pick cho uh, chosen, then you may not have the availability as high. Um, so you have to you have to pick two, and and all three are not going to be important. Once again, you may have read that, and there's some examples of which databases really are there to certain categories, like the CA category. Uh, consistency and availability is the forte of RDBMSs, right? And AP category, it's you have databases like Cassandra 
or CouchDB. Um, and CP category, you have MongoDB, you have HBase, you have Memcache, you have Bigtable, you have Redis, right? All these different databases. So once again, these are all the factors that you may want to think about when you are having a database or thinking about what database should I select? So there's not a straightforward answer. What I'm trying to say is because of the plethora of databases that are out there, the different situations that you could see with your data, uh, but based on the industry that you could be part of or the type of data that you want to bring in and, and store or maybe do analytics or maybe it, it should be moving or it should be, you know. So there are a lot of these things that all these different factors that you have to think about before selecting a database. So before we kind of move out of this topic and, and close it out, I just wanted to kind of give you a glimpse of some of the databases that are kind of very popular. Of course, don't want to um, kind of put a plug in for any of these databases. I'm just kind of showing um, what has been, you know, like from the sources that are you know, mentioned on these slides here, these are some of the very hot databases that they, they saw within in 2022. You have Oracle, you have MySQL, you have SQL Server or PostgreSQL or MongoDB, Redis, IBM. So it, it's kind of a variety of databases, but these are some of the popular ones. Now for the web applications, there's another group of you know databases, and some of the database may be you know same as what you saw on the previous slide. But once again, that the source of this was from through a survey um, that was conducted, I think in the Stack Overflow. So uh, this that's the Stack Overflow developer survey. Through that, um, you know they found out that these were some of the most popular databases that people thought are being used for developing web applications, right? And then finally, want to leave you with um, you know some of the databases that you can find on AWS Cloud. So very soon you will start working on AWS Cloud, and not that you can work with any of these databases because of the fact that you've got an Academy license. Um, you may be able to use a few of them and some of them, and um, you know we'll be using at least uh, you know a couple of uh, you know them that are kind of mentioned here. We'll be using them, but what I'm trying to say is that there are um, in our databases on AWS Cloud, there are databases on uh, in Azure and Google, uh, you know, and on the Google Cloud, and even on premises. There are so many databases that you may have heard about, or that you will hear in future as well. So, just just wanted to show you that list. And finally, just some food for thought. Um, while we are just going to leave this topic pretty soon, um, want to leave you with, you know, how would you take your learning about big data management forward? What is your plan to practice the knowledge and skills that you've learned during this week? And finally, have you researched areas to find big data sets and database for practicing your skills? Start thinking about it. If you have not, you know, please start thinking about how you're going to take this forward. Because if you do not take this forward, if you do not think about practicing the skills, um, you know, during this course, after this course, trust me, skills can just kind of vanish and disappear very quickly and, and you lose touch and it's gone, right? Out of sight, out of mind. And, and you know, if you're not practicing it, it's not going to come to you naturally um, when you're going to be out there in the workforce and, and all this is going to come back to you, right? Some maybe you'll start working with some of these databases that you've learned about, you, you read about, or you've talked about, okay? All right, so with that, I'm um, going to move on to your assignment two now. So um, yeah, gear up, as I said, this is going to be an exhaustive assignment. That is, and it, it's very exciting. Once again, I, I don't want to, um, you know, make you, you know, or in any way, um, you know, think on too much about, hey, you know, this is like a very exhaustive and, you know, it's, um, I don't want you to be, you know, feel scared or, you know, feel the way or pressured in any way. But, you know, this is very exciting, guys. So please take it on. Um, it's, it's a very simple exercise to get your feet wet on the AWS cloud. At the same time, we have made it relevant to what you've gone through, right? You've, you've heard about data lakes. You've read about data lakes. How about creating a data lake? 
right? In AWS, see how simple it is to um, build something very close to a data lake and using some a couple of services through getting some data into your data lake and then using some basic analysis, right? So that's what this assignment is about. The uh, and it, this assignment differs from many assignments that you may have done in, in many other previous courses and also your first assignment. And, and that is, there's a quiz associated with the assignment. So your assignment is not complete or you won't get full, full points for it until two things. One, you need to submit the assignment sheet with the screenshots and responses that you're going to record while you're doing the assignment. Number two, whatever you're recording it is not just for putting in the sheet and submitting it, it's going to be useful for completing the quiz. There are 13, 13 questions in the quiz that you need to complete, right? So there are two attempts like any other quiz. And hopefully if you've done the an assignment, there's no need to worry about it. You have all the answers um, for, you know, if you have captured all the responses, you've done all the work during the assignment, and that's what you're going to take it in your quiz for the assignment, okay? So relax, there's not much, there's not going to be anything any theoretical that could be asked in the quiz. The quiz, assignment two quiz is only about assignment two, period, okay? So the purpose of this assignment is to prepare you to load data into AWS S3, to use it as one of the most popular big data storage solutions, such as Data Lake, which I just mentioned, and then make use of other AWS services, such as Glue and Athena, to apply structure to the data that is loaded into the data lake, and then finally explore and analyze it using the Athena uh, AWS service, okay? So looking at it, you know, it just simply in a, in a little pictorial form, it's basically, you know, you got given like three CSV files, but basically you're given CSV files like your data, which you will load it into an S3 bucket, um, which is kind of, you know, be you're kind of mimicking it's being a, a data lake. That's how one of the things are one of the services that you would use in AWS. And then through, you would use a glue, uh, uh, AWS crawler or a glue crawler, glue crawler, sorry. And through that, you know, through using glue, once you crawl your data and then crawling means it is, it is attempting to provide to get the schema to understand the schema of your database it then brings that it then brings it into athena right and once you got into glue once it you got it into some kind of a database then you can use of the athena service to query like any other sql right you'll be querying um using some very simple uh, sqls you'll be querying this data and doing some analysis Okay, so that's in a nutshell, that's that's how simple this assignment is, yet very powerful, because this is the architecture that you will see in many, many organizations, right, at many places. This is something that you would also develop uh, even, even outside. It's not just academic, but it's very powerful. This is how simply you could really take in any type of data put it in a data lake and, and, and do some analysis, right? So um, the prerequisites, of course, as I said, you need to establish your AWS Academy, um, you know, um, I'm sorry, not the account, but you need to have an access to the lab. It is mandatory that you make use of this lab, you know, that is built for this course. You cannot do this exercise anywhere outside. It is strongly recommended that you complete all reading material and the videos that you have during this week, um, and also on the AWS services that is also part of the in, in the classroom about S3, about Glue, about Athena. It, it's it's yeah, it, it's kind of mandatory to know what you're using and why you're using. What are these services before you really make use of them? Okay. So some some special instructions. Once again, everything that you're seeing on this slide. A lot of it and, and most of it is, is in your, within your assignment document. I'm just bringing it up so that, you know, I could just bring it to the fore. What is important here? What is in this assignment that you should really pay attention to and know, okay? So 
very important, the multiple sections or steps that are involved in this assignment, which need to be executed meticulously. So it may take some time and quite likely, you will not be able to finish it in one sitting. Very, yeah, it's kind of important. It, trust me, any of these assignments that you see, you can really finish it within a few hours. So, but understandably, you have lots of other things going on in your life. You may not have all that time to kind of do it in one sitting, which is fine, right? If you have to do this assignment in multiple sessions and few section by section, then ensure that the previous prerequisite sections and steps are run again. That is very important because there are things that are, you know, that needs to be, you know, alive, right? At that point in time. So you may have to kind of go through them again, just to make sure that you kind of followed it. And if it needs to be executed, right? Because it's, it's in one step execution that is required here. So keep that in mind. And when you have completed all the steps in the, in the, which is listed in your assignment document, then complete the quiz, which verifies your assignment completion. You're welcome to refer to this assignment when you complete the quiz. So you can refer to this document, which I was talking about, like a lot of what is going to be captured in your document is going to be used in your quiz. So just have the document in front of you and it's an open book. It's an open assignment. So everything that you've done here, all the hard work is done. All that needs to be done is take it from that document and put it in the in the uh, and answer your quiz question. Boom, that's it. Okay, but that's important because that's what is going to give you the full points for this assignment. You may also use the quiz results to update your homework file, right? So vice versa, if that's that's the case, and you have to kind of make sure you correct it. And when you have completed the online quiz, submit the submit this assignment completed Word document. Very important, right? So that submission is a must. So quiz, just doing quiz is not going to fetch you full points. Just completing the Word document and submitting is not going to give you 100 point, uh, full points. Doing both is what is going to give you both the point, which is submitting the document and doing the quiz. And remember, you can always reach out to me um, at any point in time. You can reach out to Yelena. If anything that goes wrong or any issues that you're having with the lab, Anyway, once again, raise the Salesforce ticket, email it to you know Yelena, and and you can copy me as well in case you want to. But yeah, giving Yelena the you know heads up or the ticket number is going to help her to kind of start working on it right away, right? So very important. But if you are going to wait until Tuesday night, you could be out of luck. Please do not wait until Tuesday night. This assignment cannot be done at you know, 11 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night and to be finished and wrapped up by 12 night uh, or by, by midnight for your submission. And moreover, if you land into any issues, all bets are off that you could have Yelena or myself available right at that point to help you, right? So start working on it right now. So the goal is very simple, but very powerful once again, very, very realistic, right? The goal is to use the data, which is 350,000 plus applications. Um, there are 1.7 million bureau credits and 27 million, uh, 27 million transactions of bureau balances that are provided by home credit to explore and analyze uh, further by primarily using data lake to save the data and Athena to analyze the data and enrich the data set. So currently, the home credit can only provide loans to the top 50 or 100 applications that have a long credit history, but not pass due credit by more than 30 days of more than $10,000. So, so the, you are going to help the home credit loan service to kind of provide loans to 50 and 200 applications but making sure you're going to give it to the right applications. So that's the kind of analysis we're doing. So we're trying to make it realistic, very real to an outside world, what you may face in outside world and, and what kind of data that you may see in outside world. And yet simple enough that you, you can do it in a few hours, you can do it in an environment that is going to support you know, doing all this very quickly. So 
some do's and don'ts, and you know, clean up all AWS services that are used for this assignment. Very important, guys. I can't tell you, and Yelena can tell you many, many stories about how people have left these services on forever, or they have used the full capacity. And, and uh, you know, it's going to be a very difficult task for Yelena, myself, um, to really go out and reset the um, what has been uh, allocated to you. So you've been allocated certain dollar amounts that, you know, is, is going to be much more than enough to do all the assignments. But if you're not going to follow the rules, trust me, you can just take off everything that is going to be what that is given for the course, you will be using it in few days time. If you are not going to be deleting this clean up, uh, cleaning up these AWS services. And this instructions on how to clean up is part of your assignment. So follow those steps just because it's clean up and saying shut down, just don't give up on that time saying, okay, I don't need to do anything because I'm not going to be asked in the quiz about cleanup. Guess what? Yes, we're not going to be asking you about cleanup process in, in the quiz or anywhere, but but it will show up in your lab. I can, I'll be able to see that you you put, you left some of the services as is and you are incurring charges for those services. So I, I so once again, very important, besides me looking at it, what can also happen is that you've run out of all the credit that has been given to you. And Yelena and I will have to spend a lot of time trying to fix that or may not be able to fix it as well. And you being out of luck for it, okay? So ensure the AWS lab is also shut down. After you're cleaning it, make, make sure you shut down and you end it gracefully, right? After every usage, same, all these instructions are in the assignment. One more important point to remember, you can use the lab for continuous four hours, okay? So again, four hours, remember the number of fingers here. That's as many hours you can go with the uh, lab each session, okay? So if we are getting close to four hours, I would suggest you save whatever you have, you know, exit out, shut down the lab, and then come back, start the restart the lab, come back in again, you reset the timer, right? A lot of the services would be there for you that you've taken, so you don't have to repeat the steps if you're going to be coming back right away, right? So once again, you can use as many hours as you want, but at a single time, at a single session, it's only four hours. So you may not get any reminder. You may not see anything pop up on your screen. Hey, four hours are up, right? You will just see some errors you know, coming like while you're processing something in AWS, all of a sudden you'll start seeing weird errors that are not part of the assignment that you're not expecting it. But just because your four hours are up there, you start seeing some errors that you would not know why it's occurring. But anyway, it's because you, your four hours are up, something is being shut down in the background that you're not being aware of, or that it's not telling you what is being shut down. So before it does that, you need to shut it down yourself. Okay. And of course, as, as I said, it's, uh, your assignment is not complete until the quiz is attempted and completed. And importantly, capture all the screenshots and record all your responses accurately in the assignment document as it is instructed. Take your time, go slow, right? Because you you don't may not want to kind of do the entire assignment again, just because you, either you fail to record it, you're not sure if you recorded it correctly, so it's better that you spend good amount of time while recording it and going slowly and doing it, right? That way you can just do it once and do it right the very first time and the only time that you have to do this assignment, okay? All right, so the rubric is, you know, for every step, every section of the assignment and mostly the, the assignment where the responses or you're capturing the screenshots, um, you are, you know, being given points. So please go through the rubric. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's part of your assignment. You will see a rubric that is already there with the assignment. Take a look at it. If not, you know, take a come, come here to the screen, uh, to this recording, and you can pause here and, and just read through all the, all the areas uh, which are going to be graded and you'll be given points for. Okay. 
So with that, I believe um, we've come to the end of this webinar. Um, this is what I really wanted to cover with you all. And understandably, because you know, um, you're not around here live with me, um, and I'll look for your questions. Um, maybe after the webinar, after the recording, after viewing this recording, if you have any questions, as I said, you can write to me, to Yelena, or you know, you can just post it in the classroom. I suggest posting in the classroom to be the best choice if there are any questions with any content here, anything that we covered in the webinar, or anything about the assignment. Okay. So with that, I'm going to call it a wrap. And I wish you all uh, good luck and hope uh, you watch this recording completely to understand um, what is needed from you from assignment two perspective, uh, what is needed from you uh, from a discussion perspective that is you know closing tomorrow. And, um, and also, as I said, there's some supplement information about the databases um, and hope um, that you liked it and uh, you know it, it is it's going to be useful to you. All right, with that, um, thank you all and good day, good night.